Welcome back from our AP Biology. Today we're going to deal with animal and plant circulation, which is kind of a really big field. So we're going to look at the role of gradients in how circulation works in plants and animals. So a whole bunch of things. Here's where it comes from in the textbook. When we look at circulation, it turns out we have some required parts. So if we look at circulation, we need to have a pump, let's call it the heart. We need to have pipes, let's call them blood vessels. And we need to have a fluid, let's call them, let's call it um, blood. If I look at plants, we have the exact same phenomenon. We need to have parts in order to drive all of this. The fluids tend to be either called xylem sap or phloem sap. We'll have roots. We'll have things that increase the surface area of the roots. We call those root hairs. And we'll have leaves. In, in particular, they'll have openings that we'll call stomata. All of those turn out to be parts necessary for circulation within plants. When we look at animals, when we have fluids moving around inside of the pipes, we have one of two patterns, what we call an open circulation or a closed circulation. The difference between them is do you keep blood inside of the pipes at all times or do you allow it to flow out of the pipes? If we look at arthropods, so the things that when you step on the go crunch like insects or crustaceans or um, arachnids, what you'll notice is they actually have areas inside of their body that are all surrounded, so it's not like it's free flow, that are encapsulated where the organs are, but blood's allowed just to sit there and soak around them, and eventually gets pulled back in towards the heart. Whereas we, we don't get to do that. We always need to have blood kept inside of tubes at all times, and if we ever let it out, we have issues, and the result is we also have capillaries. So with us, us and our closed circulation, there turn out to be patterns in the ways that closed circulation can be built. If we look at a simple vertebrate like a fish, they actually have one pathway and two chambers of the heart. If we look at amphibians, they have two pathways. So one that leads to the lungs and back, one leads from the heart to the rest of the body and back. But the result, but when you look at the heart, it looks like it's not two chambers, it's actually three chambers. And when you look at us, birds and mammals, we actually have a four-chambered heart. So as we go along and compare vertebrates, what we really see changing is the structure of the heart. And if we were to look at how our heart gets built, you actually see it run through the two-chamber version, then the three-chamber version, till eventually we get to the four-chamber version. Take physiology, we talk about it there. What the heart ultimately does is it's a driver of pressure. Everything in your body that's a fluid will move according to pressure. Stuff will move from high pressure to low pressure, meaning we have high pressure inside of your heart, so blood goes out of your heart. Travels around the body, and eventually it's going to come back to the heart because your heart can actually make for a very low pressure. The heart is capable of shifting its pressure, so it's the highest point and the lowest point. By doing that, blood flows in a circle. Plants actually do the exact same thing. They just use water potential. But the units of water potential are bars, but they could also be tors or millimeters or mercury or inches of mercury, which are units of pressure. So they actually do the exact same thing. Because as we have transpiration, we move water from low, or the highest po water potential, the highest pressure, to the lowest water potential, to the lowest pressure. And if we do that, we get transpiration. In our bodies, we move blood from the highest pressure to the lowest pressure. They are the exact same. The difference is with us, we ignore solute potential. Plants need to take into consideration solute potential. We just use the pressure potential. As we look at us and we have our pipes, our pipes turn out to have different functions. It's not super important that you understand all the functions. I just wish to point them out. So arteries and anything that sounds like that, their job is to maintain pressure. Capillaries are there for exchange. So that's where we're going to have nutrient exchange and osmosis really starts to kick in. Then we have the, the venous side or the vein type things, and that's just a big storage bag for blood. But plants are the exact same way. They turn out to have two different types of tissues that conduct. <clears throat> we have xylem, which primarily deals with water and things that are dissolved inside the water, and it's meant to go from roots up to the leaves. 
but nearby there will also be another tissue called phloem. And phloem contains tree sap or plant sap, it doesn't matter if it's a tree or not, which are metabolites, things that the plant actually made, and that those substances can turn out to flow up or down the plant. And it's there as a different type of connect or different type of transportation mechanism. Xylem vessels do not connect with phloem vessels. So it's two totally separate yet parallel systems, unlike us, where we actually have the arteries connecting to capillaries, which connect to veins, which will connect back through the heart to arteries again. When we look at capillaries, they actually turn out to be places where water potential is fair game. What we play around with is water or the pressure potential, just having water sit there and blood pressure and what we would call interstitial pressure. We also deal with the solute potential. So we have stuff dissolved and that's going to trigger osmosis. And what we end up getting within capillaries is we have fluid that flows out and then flows back in. We don't end up reclaiming all of that liquid at the capillaries. We need another system called the lymphatic system in order to really reclaim all the liquid. But the result is we play with water potential and we have osmosis going on. Since we're dealing with osmosis and we are a little bit more complicated in this regard than plants are, when we look at blood, it actually has a whole bunch of components in it. But most of it turns out to be water. And it turns out water is not evenly distributed throughout the body. We have this very odd sense, and this is for humans, but we can almost make this claim for virtually all animals, that we think that, oh, blood is like where all the liquid is. But no, in reality, about two-thirds of it turns out to be inside of your cells. Then another of this, the one-third that remains, about 75 to 80 percent of it, turns out to be surrounding your cells. And then only a little bit of it turns out to be actually in your blood. So actually, overall, the water of your body, very little of it turns out to be your blood. The rest of it is actually in your cells or surrounding your cells. Plants have a strange method of breathing, so we're going to deal with that later when we talk about photosynthesis. But with animals, we have to breathe we need to move and get oxygen and remove CO2. And the way that we do this, at least us land-based animals, is we use pressure because everything moves from high pressure to low pressure. We can do that for water potential, which is high pressure to low pressure. We do that with blood, high pressure to low pressure. What we do when we breathe is we actually expand our chests. When you expand your chest, you actually decrease the pressure inside of your chest and air gets shoved into your body. When you breathe out, you compress your chest, which increases the pressure, and it shoves the air out. Every single time when you breathe in and breathe out, what you're actually doing is manipulating the environment to either have air get pushed in or you push air out. You do not suck air in. You just lower the pressure. The goal is to get oxygen, and the problem is if you live in the water, Water doesn't have a lot of oxygen, so we actually have to have a different mechanism for them, and it's something we refer to as the countercurrent mechanism, which is shown in the very bottom right of this picture. It's where blood flows one way and water flows the opposite, and what this does is it ensures that we always have fully saturated blood with oxygen. It's an evolu evolutionary adaptation that is brilliant, but involves math, so we don't care right now. The whole point of this ventilation thing is so that we could put oxygen into your bloodstream and then have that circulate around. Oxygen and CO2 will follow pressure, meaning there's more ox there's higher oxygen pressure in the atmosphere than in my lungs, so oxygen goes into my lungs. There's more oxygen pressure in my lungs than there is in my blood, so oxygen will go into my blood. There's more oxygen pressure in my blood than there is in my cells, so it will move into my cells. There's a higher CO2 pressure in my cells than in my blood, so CO2 goes from cells to blood. I have higher CO2 pressure in my blood than I have in my lungs, so the CO2 will go from blood into the lungs, and there's higher CO2 pressure in my lungs than there is in the atmosphere, so the CO2 flows out. Everything always flows from high pressure to low pressure, no matter what, without exception.